format today is our question we are going to answer is how has your church or your experiences with churches engaged the complexities of racialization? And after our panelists respond to that question, we're gonna have a chance to dialogue around the table and then to have Q&A uh, with uh, our pastors. So we're 13 years old. Uh, it was a church plant um, that we planted 13 years ago. And um, the honest answer is we're still struggling through it. We're still struggling through it. Um, it's by far the toughest thing I've ever done. You know, I've been in ministry for about 25 years, and it's by far the toughest thing I've ever done. Um, and most recently, let me just start here. Most recently, um, I just uh, finished a uh, 12 week, 12 week small group with a group of 18 folks in our church reading through the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And um, that was tough, man. It's tough because on one hand, it gives you a sense of reality and what's happening in our country when it comes to issue of race. And it seems so overwhelming and so daunting um, when you, look, when you look at systems and institutions and laws and every element of our society that is contributing to and influencing racialization in our culture. Um, so on one end, just, just finding myself overwhelmed. I and mean, we have a, a, a multi-ethnic church, lots of young people in their 20s and 30s, folks who are engaged in diverse relationships, folks who understand issues of systems and institutions and so on and so forth, but it's another thing entirely to be the church and to be this entity that Christ put on earth to reflect his kingdom and to be, to be a body of justice and compassion, mercy and love, to, to be this transformative countercultural entity in our culture, um, to live into the reality of that is, uh, is daunting, it's challenging. Having said that, I am a pastor and I am a follower of Jesus and I do believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again and is returning someday and that in the meantime, we are called, empowered by the Holy Spirit to impact our culture and our society, spiritually in every other way. And so we move forward with hope that he is with us and that this is possible. If I didn't believe that, I'd, I'd, I'd quit tomorrow, to be honest with you. If I didn't really believe that the gospel had the power to transform even this country. And I say this with, with, with full conviction. I'd walk away tomorrow. If I didn't believe that the church could actually be a transformative agent in this culture, I would quit tomorrow. So the only thing that keeps me going is knowing that empowered by the Holy Spirit, the church can and must make a difference in this country. At a Christian Neighbors Church in Waukegan, as we think about you know, engaging the complexities of racialization, uh, the first thing that we're doing is, is we're talking about it. We found that if we don't create an intentional space where we can interact about racialization and race relations, um, not only are we not addressing the problem, we're perpetuating the problem. So. Uh, we learn from the Word of God in those conversations, and we learn from each other. And uh, really quickly, the, the way that we're um, framing this issue in our church um, is from a, a Genesis 127 perspective. Uh, God created us in the image of God as we look at the evil of racialization in our, you know, in our county, in our country. It's a violation of the principle that we're all bearing that special status equally. Uh, and that's, that's something that we need to recognize. That's something we need to affirm. That's 
a notion in uh, the book Every People and Nation, by Daniel Hayes. We also are changing the way we talk about sin as not only individual and personal, but social and systemic. Uh, we're changing the way we think about the atonement of Christ as uh, something that has implications for every person, and not just for every person, but for the overturning of the, the evil uh, social order that we're all caught up in that drives racialization. And we're asking as a church, uh, what are we called to do about it? Like, what does this mean? So what? Now, as you think about the situation in Lake County, um, in my opinion, you, you really do have something that's reflective of what's going on in America as a whole, because Lake County is a microcosm of America. And let me tell you what's happening. Like, you know, it, I can get to Lake Forest from my house in South Waukegan in about 10 minutes. And um, as you think about the, the racialized wealth gap, uh, there are a lot of things that go into that. Uh, one thing that affects that profoundly is educational inequity. Um, let me throw some stats at you really quickly. 18% of Waukegan students uh, who graduated achieved 21 or higher on their ACT. That means 18% graduated ready to do college coursework in 2014. Compare that to students in Lake Forest where 85% of them achieved a 21 or higher on their ACT. When it comes to instructional spending for students, nearly 7,000 more per high school student is uh, spent on instructional spending. When it comes to operational spending, there's a $10,000 difference between students in Lake Forest and in Waukegan. Uh, how does that relate to this? Because that affects Latinos and African Americans at a strikingly disproportionate rate. So um, Lake Forest students, you know, you look at their high school demographics, 90.6% of them are white. In Waukegan, 76% of our students are Hispanic, 15% are African American. So what does that mean? Our kids in Waukegan, our La Latino and African American kids, they face way more obstacles when they're trying to fulfill their God-given potential. And as Christians, we need to just recognize that's not right. <laughs> and the church ought to be concerned about that. Now, as, as a new church that is still you know, struggling through it as well, um, only more so because we're only five years old, uh, we've asked, okay, what, what role can we play right now? And so what we've done is, is we've partnered up with an organization called Waukegan to College. They're uh, not only tutoring students, but they're mentoring them throughout the whole college uh, you know, preparation process. They're also taking them to workshops and going on college visits uh, with our students. And you know, we're recruiting from them, uh, we're volunteering together, we have a good relationship so that hopefully this is something that can be part of uh, what God is doing to change our community. Um, I think as, as we consider what we're called to do in terms of, of advocacy, so often we, we look at the complexity of the problem, we look at uh, how, you know, how difficult it is to address, and sometimes we shirk back and ask, you know, what can we do? But what we've seen is there is literally something every church in every area can do to address this issue, and not just talk about it, but counteract it with actual action. In addition to what just Luke said, I would like to um, focus in what we are trying to practice in our, inside of the organization. We're trying to do three things, um, is giving um, empowerment through giving voice and vote to minorities. Um, second, um, giving the opportunity to develop the, their talents, their ministry, uh, and third, <clears throat> help them to face reality. And all those three things by advocating to one another. Um, how giving voice and vote is because sometimes in uh, in the organization, and the, when you take the, and the place where you take the main decisions from the church, sometimes only represent the majority of the church and not 
the multi ethnicity that represent in the church. And, um, and we are trying to represent our community, which is uh, African American and, and Hispanic. And sometimes as we are growing, um, the, for instance, the worship team um, make a wonderful work when they prepare uh, songs in Spanish, and they are singing those songs for only five or 10 members of the church. And that represent care for them. So I can wanna use that as an um, illustration to uh, say that when you are in the liturgy, you, we are practicing how to hear the other necessities and advocate for them, because the tendency is to minimize them. The second thing is empowering others um, and help them to do their ministry and to do what they, that they can do in according with the gifts that God give them and, um, and don't try to control, don't try to um, manipulate what is happening. And the third thing is uh, facing reality. I try to recognize that uh, myself and the community that I'm representing, the majority of us, we are immigrants, of course, and first, second, third generation, and um, we need to encounter face-to-face -face the um, challenges that we have. And as a, um, a, as a pastor, I also recognize in that we have two different things in terms of valuing one another because um, I think that in this country, credentials are more respect in that vocation. This is my personal uh, opinion. And in our countries, is the other way around. And I think in order to do a better job, we need to grow helping to one another. And um, so that's facing reality for me. And um, that's why I'm responding to the call of being in this school and studying. And Luke is responding to the call by extending, extending me grace to being here and face all the challenges that that imply, uh, um, that that thing imply. And also that is um, affecting different levels because for instance, in my denomination, there is only two or three, I guess, pastors that have MDs. So other suddenly I'm finding out that I have a couple more than 10 pastors praying for me, trying to get me out of the program so I can <laughs> advocate for them. So it's very interesting. So I'm wondering, um, that is facing reality in your own context. And where are you in, um, in your community and try to work accordingly? Thanks. So I have a question. How do you guys handle it when, so like I'm at a small church uh, in the suburbs, when you feel like this conversation started but it's just straight up stalled? So they've started the conversation, it's even part of our mission statement, but there's this feeling that we've put Spanish on the slides and we're still singing entirely Caucasian songs, but you know, there's a Spanish bad translation at the bottom. Um, and there's this thing like, well now we've kind of done our part and we can go back to the important core of things. So how do you guys have any advice for actually getting the conversation to go beyond just the intro phase? I'm of the mindset that how the local church that body of believers, what they perceive the gospel to be, what they perceive the gospel to be, what it is that Jesus reconciled. I think it's critical to impacting the larger ethos and culture of the church. I mean, just be, I just think that it's critical and important, and, and, and you mentioned that as well, I think it's critical and important that there be a, a saturation within that church culture that the gospel in its essence didn't just reconcile us to God, but that it, it reconciled us to each other and the created order. That has to, I think, permeate, I think, everything that you do. Otherwise, otherwise, what I've seen is it either becomes tokenism or a nice thing on the side or something that we're gonna do because this is what good Christians do versus fundamentally this is what Jesus accomplished and fundamentally this is what God is ultimately going to finish. Because um, it's more than just singing songs. You know, it's more than having folks on leadership. It's more than programming. It's, more, it's the essence of what is it we're called to do. 
And the secondly, I, I, I would say is this, and, and again, this is a very impractical question. Any church body that wants to truly be serious about this, I think, has to answer this question. I'm going to quote Tim Keller from his book, Generous Justice. He defines justice, or tzaddik, as the righteous are those who are willing to disadvantage themselves to advantage the community, and the wicked are those who are willing to disadvantage the larger community in order to advantage themselves. For this question to be answered in this country, the folks with advantage has to answer the question of, what am I willing to disadvantage, give up, sacrifice, let go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in order to advantage the larger human community that is here? And that question answers power, wealth, education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In a local church, you have to ask that question. What does it mean for those of us that are in power to disadvantage ourselves so that those who are disadvantaged can be advantaged? Um, I would just say, like, how many friends that you have that look different than you? Everything started when you have a relationship with somebody, and then you get to know them, and then you can advocate for them. And when God speaks to your heart, you're not going to be quiet. You're going to be speaking for others. And I think that minorities need voices. Um, but everything started with relationships, and um, and it's hard, as we all know, we cannot change any anybody. Uh, but at least just having um, uh, understanding what is happening and just voicing, like saying what others are saying, uh, uh, feeling, and when you have opportunities to um, to speak, just do it. I've been finding myself uh, um, brothers that are African American. Sometimes they advocate for me in a way that I cannot express. Um, because um, we, you know, is it, we can go deep in, deeply in this, but just putting in words that you, people like look like you, I want to say it, can understand it. That's the role. Um, and of course, everything started with you and then kind of being intentional and bringing this conversation to others and uh, and make your family an example of, I, I wanna know, I wanna love others and look, look different than me. And, and this is not only for you, I think like this is a challenge for all students here as well. And I'm trying to say this with integrity since I am a student here. So yeah, if we don't start there, I don't think that we're not gonna do a good job in the future.